Welcome back to Argonne, right? We are very happy to see people in the room tonight. First time in many, many, many moons. So welcome to those uh, here in person. My name is Leslie Crone. I happen to lead communications at Argonne and our public lecture series is one of the things that we are happy to put on. So we do have an audience online as well. So welcome to them. I'm going to uh, explain a little bit about what uh, we're going to do tonight, and then I'll turn it over to our uh, scientists and uh, the rest of the program. So um, tonight our topic is batteries and energy storage and how it affects uh, or helps be part of the solution to clean energy and climate challenges. So um, that's our topic. We've got a lot to talk about. If you are in the room, I'm going to ask you to get out your cell phones and mute them, please. Uh, that way we won't have any interruptions. If you are online, we already muted you uh, and your audio and video are turned off. However, there is a chat feature for our online participants. Uh, they can type in questions. I will be monitoring those in the back. If you're in the room, uh, hopefully someone handed you an index card and a pencil. So you can, there's an example right there. Uh, you can write your questions down and we will collect them uh, uh, at the appropriate point in the program and be able to uh, ask our panelists questions that way. So we'll take both online and in the room questions. Um, on this slide, yeah, great. This is our slide. If you are remote and are having technical difficulties, our Argonne Service Desk is going to be on the line to help you. So uh, there's the phone number. You click option two, and uh, people will help you troubleshoot if you're having trouble with video or audio. I think that's all my housekeeping notes. Um, so uh, we will record this. So anybody who wants to watch it again later can catch it on YouTube in a couple of days. And with that, I'm going to introduce Paul Kearns, our laboratory director, and uh, he will kick us off tonight. Well, thank you very much, uh, Leslie. And, and let me add my uh, just the perspective that it's really fantastic to see people come to the laboratory and, and join us in person, as well as those of you that are joining uh, virtually online. And welcome to all. We're excited about this evening. I think we'll have a great program. Um, I'm Paul Kearns, and, and as uh, Leslie indicated, I'm the director of Argonne. I have the honor, really, of serving as the director of Argonne National Laboratory. It's a special place, and I, I'm really pleased that we can share a little bit of our science with you this evening and talk a little bit about the laboratory's impact and, and the things we're up to in terms of energy storage. So it's really a pleasure to host this program. Uh, the hybrid format, as you all know, allows us to share our cutting-edge research and pivotal discoveries with a wider audience, so we're pleased everyone can join. And, I have to say it's a bit chillier than I expected uh, this evening. That wind is pretty tough out there. Uh, so please uh, take care of yourself as you depart the building uh, when the uh, out, out, uh, lecture is over. Uh, since Argonne's founding in 1946, we have unlocked new scientific frontiers and helped solve uh, many of the nation's biggest problems. Today, I can't think of a bigger problem that, that, that we're facing than climate change and its uh, harmful effects. We've all heard about the wildfires out west. Uh, we've heard about more intense hurricanes on the coast and rising sea levels worldwide. Our scientists and engineers are developing and deploying the clean energy technologies needed to combat the climate energy crisis facing our planet. To put our nation's economy on a path to net zero emissions by mid-century, we have to deliver breakthrough innovations that can accelerate our transition to clean energy for all communities. One solution hidden in plain sight is batteries. Uh, we're pleased to have the conversation tonight about that technology. Uh, Argonne has had a long history in battery innovation dating back to the 1960s. Hard to believe, but actually back to the 1960s. And has emerged as a leader in tackling today's battery challenges. In fact, Argonne's nickel manganese cobalt NMC cathode material, uh, licensed more than a decade ago, has become the dominant cathode material used by more than 50% of the electric vehicles on the road today and is projected to increase to 80% of commercial EVs by, the by 2030. Um, I love uh, to talk about the impact the laboratory delivers. This is a great example of the impact of the science we do today. Uh, and the impact it can have in the future as well. So really significant in terms of uh, where we're at and the, the contributions that we've already made to the uh, technology that's being deployed and is on the road today, so to speak. Argonne also leads the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, or JCSER as we call it. 
uh, Department of Energy Innovation Hub dedicated to designing and building transformative materials for next generation of batteries. Jay Caesar brings together you know, more than 180 researchers from 20 different institutions, national laboratories, universities, and companies from across the nation to build batteries from the bottom up, uh, atom by atom and molecule by molecule for a broad range of energy storage applications, including long duration storage for the electric grid. We play a key role in scaling these promising battery materials from milligrams to kilograms uh, through our materials engineering research facility. And to complete the value chain, we are leading new innovations for recycling battery materials through our resale center. There, this work has resulted in 38 uh, collaborative research and development projects this year with industry partners. Really significant to see industry come and, and use, uh, work with our researchers or use our facilities here at Argonne. Our collaborations extend across the country with the recently expanded Lybridge public-private partnership to close uh, the supply chain gaps on lithium battery production. There are over uh, 600 industry partners participating in that public-private effort. It also spans the globe with the Department of Energy's Net Zero World Initiative, where 10 national laboratories, including Argonne, are working together to provide the needed technical assistance for developing countries. Uh, to help them evaluate, demonstrate, and scale deployment of clean energy technologies to meet their long-term climate targets. Lybridge and Net Zero World are uh, each promoting an ex uh, exciting transition to resilient and inclusive energy systems. Tonight, you'll hear from three of Argonne's energy storage researchers who are supporting these initiatives, uh, three of our best. They are developing uh, next generation batteries that are safer, have higher energy densities, uh, longer duration, and can charge, uh, recharge at a faster rate. They are partnering with industry to bring battery solutions and innovations to the marketplace. Their work will help overcome the challenges of scarce resources, difficult overseas suppliers, and the increasing costs that are delaying the transition uh, to a clean energy future. And they are creating innovative technologies to help make battery recycling more cost effective and future batteries more affordable. Like you, I look forward to hearing the, the, the latest uh, on their research and their thoughts on the future of uh, energy storage worldwide. Uh, to moderate the, tonight's discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce Sue Babinek, Argonne's program lead for stationary storage. In her role, Sue leads a comprehensive strategy that expands the U.S. Department of Energy's vision for a future electric grid that includes a range of optimized energy storage capabilities. Thank you, Sue, for leading tonight's program. So uh, for those of you here and online, please join me in welcoming uh, Sue Babinak. So Sue, please. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Paul, for that very lovely introduction. So we're so glad that you can join us tonight. I think when you came here, you probably did not understand that this really is the mecca if you are an energy storage person. So not only do you get to do all these amazing things, but you get to integrate them and see the relationship between them because we are very much the, a national hub for all these integrated, very important uh, um, activities that go on. So again, thank you everyone and thank you so much. Now before we begin, I'd like to say just a few things and as Paul shared with us, climate change and its negative effects present our nation and the world a formidable challenge. We see examples of this every day and we hear about it constantly. It's on our mind. So as the immediacy of climate change becomes more apparent, we now know that things must change. We must transition from greenhouse gas producing fossil fuels as the norm, the primary source of energy, because it is these that are the primary driver of climate change. Now, batteries hold the key to this transition. That's what this piece of paper said. But I will tell you that as a person who does batteries, it's not just the key. They are the absolute essential enabling technology. If you're going to have transportation that's electrified, or you're going to have a grid with renewables, you must also have excellent batteries to do this. 
So before we begin to hear from our presenters, let's take a look at the ways Argonne is advancing comprehensive battery research. So we have a video. The world is in the midst of an energy transition. And you can see this all around. The way we produce, transport, and use energy has been changing dramatically in the last decade. Electric cars are slowly becoming the reality, but we need much better batteries with longer range, faster charging, and lower cost to make that into something that is mass market. Every time there's a hurricane or some sort of a wildfire, then people immediately start to ask, how are we gonna make the grid of the future more resilient? Batteries are at the heart of where we need to get to for the energy transition. Argonne has the largest number of researchers working in energy storage, and we have decades of experience trying to invent new battery materials, but also moving them to the marketplace. So if you think about Argonne's facilities, it ranges from everything from fundamental research all the way to scale up of materials, and ultimately moving those materials from a scaled state to where industry can start to use it. All batteries in the end will reach end of life, and ultimately their capacity will fade. When we do that, we have to start thinking about recycling. And we have a center at Argonne called Resell, where we are working with partners to understand how to cost-effectively recycle batteries so that we can start to view these materials as not being thrown away to the landfill, but that can come back into the supply chain. Batteries are all about finding new chemistries and materials associated with those chemistries. So that's the big effort that we're putting at Argonne, is trying to come up with those new materials and chemistries that can have an impact in energy storage and create the future of energy in this country. All right, well, thank, All right. You. thank you so much. As you can see, the development of large-scale energy storage is absolutely critical if society is going to shift away from its dependence on fossil fuels. It's not just the inventing, but it's also everything that comes after that that's equally important. Now, a recent example of the role battery innovation can play in powering clean energy and mitigating climate change hazard was provided by the community of Babcock Ranch in Florida. This is an amazing story. When the hurricane hit, Hurricane Ian hit Florida's southwestern coastline, many residents lost electricity, but those at Babcock Ranch did not. They maintained their power through the storm in part because of its 100% solar power supported by batteries for the intermittency. These batteries store electricity for later use so that power is continuously supplied, even during very severe weather events and electrical outages. Think of a battery as sort of a warehouse for energy. Okay? Now, Argonne's multidisciplinary battery research team is developing energy storage tools to meet the challenges of these new climate conditions, again, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, integrating renewable energy into the nation's electric grid, which is what I do, and of course, supporting the effort to build out climate resilient communities. So it's not just the devices, it's the whole integrated solution that we are taking part in. All right, so now, on with our show. Joining us this evening are two of my esteemed colleagues who are part of the lab's battery research team and they are eager to share the latest on their work, so let's bring them on stage. Kindly hold your applause until they have been introduced. All right, our first presenter is George Crabtree, otherwise known just as George. He's that famous. He is an Argonne Senior Scientist and Distinguished Fellow who serves as the Director of the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, which is known as J. Caesar. As Paul mentioned, Jay Caesar is an innovation hub led by Argonne and focused on advancing battery science and technology. Among his many, many responsibilities as director, George leads the overall strategy and the goals of the center's research program and operational plan. Our second speaker is Jessica, is Jessica Durham Muckles. Jessica is a materials scientist in the Applied Materials Division at Argonne. She is also lead investigator in the Department of Energy's Resell Center for Advanced Battery Recycling, which is a critical part of this whole big picture. At Resell, she investigates safe and cost-effective recycling processes for lithium-ion batteries, which as you know, are everywhere, and they focus on the scale-up of materials for energy storage applications through collabor collaborations with industry, academia, and other national labs, the whole entire ecosystem. 
please join me in welcoming George and Jessica. One of my other colleagues, Venkat Srinivasan, who was uh, narrating that uh, story there, he's the director of Access Argonne's Collaborative Center for Energy Storage. He intended to be here this evening, but unfortunately he is unable to attend. So George and Jessica are going to graciously agree to take over his themes. I have to tell you that in my many years of knowing um, Venkat, this is the first time I've ever seen him under the weather, so it's unfortunate, but we've got great, uh, two other great speakers to fill in. Okay, so to begin, okay. So to begin, each speaker will provide an overview of the challenge and the research underway in order to advance battery technology. Immediately following, we will have a question and answer session. So I encourage our virtual audience to use the chat feature to submit your questions to the researchers. And for those who are in person tonight, those brave souls, please write your questions on the index cards you received when you entered. The staff will retrieve these cards later in the program. We will address as many as possible. And with no further ado, George, why not? Well, <coughs> excuse me, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Susan, that was wonderful. And it's great to see so many people here on a cold night. We're gonna talk about climate change and batteries, and that seems appropriate for the weather. We won't forget this, I guess. Uh, and uh, I'm privileged to be the first speaker, and Jessica will tell you much more probably than I will about, re about resell and recycling batteries and so on. Uh, if we could maybe have the first slide. Yeah, so here is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, next generation energy storage, that's Jay Caesar, as you heard from Paul and you heard from Sue. Uh, and in particular, here's the message. We have about half the commercial technology that we need to decarbonize. And putting a timeline on it, 2050, decarbonized by 2050, makes it even more urgent. So the things we have that we uh, can roll out now, the commercial technology, well, we have solar panels, we have wind turbines, we have battery storage in the form of lithium ion batteries, and we can roll these things out to clean up the grid. Uh, we have, an, for transportation, EVs, that would be passenger cars, otherwise known as light duty vehicles, uh, but we don't have commercial technology for the other half, which in, for the grid is long duration storage. So there are many consecutive cloudy or, or uh, calm days, as many as 10 in a row historically, and a lithium ion battery can discharge at full power for four hours. So we're far from meeting that goal. We need the next generation. Uh, when it comes to cars, we can take care of passenger cars, light duty transportation, but not rail, not long haul uh, trucks, not marine shipping, and not aviation. So for those things, you need typically two to three or even more times the energy density of the battery. The lithium ion battery, it's heavy and it doesn't carry enough electrical charge for its weight. So next slide, we'll talk about um, Really, the, uh, the, need, well, the need for long-term uh, uh, discharge storage. So we're all familiar with passing clouds, uh, gusty winds. A passing cloud can reduce the output of a solar panel by 70%. That's something you have to make up for, and you need to do it right on the spot. Lithium-ion battery is perfect for that. As I mentioned, it can discharge at full power four hours. Passing clouds never last that long. Uh, and gusty, neither does gusty wind. So um, that's great. But when it comes to longer term storage, up to 10 consecutive days, we're in trouble. And uh, that's where we need the next generation battery, which has to be, by the way, a lot cheaper than lithium ion because it's not used as often. Uh, and that means we have to get it down, lithium ion's about $140 a kilowatt hour. We have to get down to 14. And that's a huge, huge goal. When it comes to seasonal demand, so cold winters, as we have in Chicago, might be hot summers, as you have in the southern part of the US, you have to store energy seasonably, and we do it now by storing natural gas in underground caverns, also in pipelines, uh, for the winter. 
and you may have been reading in Ukraine, this is a, a challenge in Europe. Uh, they have about 85% of their winter storage already complete, uh, but they're not expecting that next year will be any easier than, than this year. So these are the challenges we face. And next slide, we'll talk about transportation. And you see plotted here are the carbon emissions from transportation vehicles. The biggest, the bottom blue, is passenger cars. That's about 50% of the CO2 that we emit every year. And then comes the other things that I mentioned before, so long haul trucking, rail, uh, shipping, and aviation. That's the other 50%. So lithium ion can take care of passenger cars. We've kind of agreed on that. The manufacturers agree, governments agree, even consumers agree that we need to, if we're gonna decarbonize by 2050, we need to replace most of the gasoline cars by 2035. Why? Because the lifetime of a car is about 15 or 16 years. So this is the goal. And uh, it's possible that we can get there. The problem is deployment. How fast can you roll out those electric vehicles? Now, I would say optimistic projections are that the market will grow by about a factor of 10 by 2030 and then another factor of two by, say, 2040. And if we can do that, we'll get there. But the problem is deployment. Next slide, we'll talk about, here's the, uh, the energy required or the battery required for each of those uh, heavy duty transportation modes. You can see where lithium ion is today at the bottom. Uh, if we get a solid state lithium ion battery, which probably in the next five years is something that could happen, I might be a bit optimistic, uh, will raise the energy density. For the light duty vehicles, and that includes things like delivery trucks and uh, even in some cases uh, urban buses, we need a little bit more energy density. But then you can see it's quite a climb to get all of heavy duty transportation uh, electrified. Next slide will show where Argon is working, and this is what Paul and Sue were talking about, to meet these goals. So it's a circle. Uh, it goes, it integrates all the silos of energy storage. So things like new materials, things like um, uh, system analytics, you wanna, you wanna understand the battery on the computer before you actually build it in the laboratory. Materials discovery, that's a very important part, and things like artificial intelligence really help you accelerate the pace. Material scale up, and this is something that uh, Jessica and others are working on in uh, the materials engineering research facility, uh, and standardized testing and acceleration of lifetime. So these are the things that Argon does, and as Paul was mentioning, we've been doing this for a long time. We're always increasing uh, our capability and, and expanding the frontier. Next slide, we'll talk about a big success for J. Caesar, but also for the country. Uh, it's a spin out company called Form Energy that we, J. Caesar, spun out in 2017. Uh, and they uh, are now building and will soon deliver a next generation battery. It's based on iron, water, and oxygen. You couldn't imagine a simpler supply chain, and it's sort of universally available everywhere. And get this, it makes a battery that can discharge at full power for four days. Lithium ion can discharge for four hours. It's not 10 days, we're only halfway there, 40% there, but it's a big step forward. And I would say, I think most would agree, that among the commercial battery contenders uh, for long duration storage, that Form Energy is the leading one at the moment. So they, I should mention the last bullet there, they're collaborating with Georgia Power to deliver in 2024 uh, this battery which can discharge for 100 hours. So um, let's see, next slide please. So I mentioned that we need next generation technology, commercial technology. That's a long time scale. And you see here, uh, starting in 1980, it took about 
20, what, about 10 years to uh, get the cathode for today's lithium ion battery. Manganese based cathode to market, that was even longer. That's something like uh, 20 years. And uh, the nickel manganese cobalt based cathode to market, that took us about, uh, well, it came out in 2011, so it took us about 15 years. And that is a long time scale. Now, I just mentioned Form Energy. Uh, they began operations in 2017, and within, what, six years, seven years, 2024, uh, they're going to be delivering the battery. So although this is history, these long time scales, it is possible to do it on a much faster time scale, and that's what we're looking for. So next slide. There's another problem besides just technology. It's robust supply chains. I think everybody knows that the lithium ion supply chain is challenging. It's international, as Paul mentioned, sometimes with what might be unreliable partners. Uh, it's expensive, and some of the materials, quite a few of them, are not earth abundant, rather they're earth limited. So that's why, for example, when you buy an EV, and I'm sure you all will, uh, 30% of that cost is going to be for the battery itself. So we really need something better. Uh, and that's the next generation battery. So something that has a robust supply chain that's re inexpensive, readily available, and, uh, and earth abundant. And this would enable, let's say, manufacturing in the United States or anywhere. Uh, and this is a big problem. You may have realized that or noticed that in the last two years, this problem has really come to the fore. And the government has stepped in rather aggressively to, uh, let's say, uh, launch a program that makes these manufacturing industri industries, like, for example, EVs, solar panels, and lithium ion batteries, centered in the United States. Next slide. So what are they doing? We're creating an innovation ecosystem. Who's in it? It's uh, sort of academia and labs like Argonne and all the many universities around Chicago. Uh, it's the uh, federal agencies, DOE is one of them, and maybe one of the main ones, but also DOD, Commerce, State, uh, and maybe up to 10 others. They're all cooperating. This is a little bit unusual in the federal government to have close, quote, close uh, cooperation as we're getting now. Uh, and then there's industry, very importantly. It's industry in the United States, in Europe, in most countries that delivers goods and services to everybody in the country. EVs are a good example. Wouldn't happen without industry. So you have to have coordination among all three of these sectors to make manufacturing locally, EVs, solar panels, batteries, a reality. Uh, and Lybridge, which Paul mentioned in the intro, is something that has just come up in what, the last six months or so, but has great promise to really uh, promote this new ecosystem. So next slide. And that was my last slide, as you may have guessed. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to introduce Jessica durham mackles Please, Jessica, for you. Hi everyone. Uh, I'd like to follow up on George's talk by how, telling you how important it is to recycle batteries we're using as part of our transition to clean energy. Next slide, please. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about battery recycling tonight because it is one of my passions. Um, recycling, it's not only important for keeping lithium ion batteries out of landfills because they do contain toxic chemicals, but also to allow the U.S. to capture critical materials that are inside of the batteries. Some of these critical materials include lithium, cobalt, nickel, and graphite. I've just mentioned the term critical materials a few times, so I'd like to take the opportunity to briefly tell you what that means and why it's important. Critical materials means there are limited resources across the globe. Like uh, George said, we have various, very limited resources of these. 
Um, two, there is a very high risk associated with their supply. As we said, unreliable partners who export and mine these materials. Um, and third, that these materials are difficult to substitute because they have very unique properties that lend very well to them being used in batteries. And currently the US, like I said, relies heavily on other countries for these materials. We have very small reserves of these. Um, so in a lot of cases, it's not even possible for us to provide these ourselves here in the US. Therefore, um, we really need to reduce our reliance on um, other countries. And to do that, we need to recycle batteries. So we've already mined and dug these materials out of the ground and put them into batteries. So we need to get those back out. We don't just want to throw those away because they are such limited resources. And one more issue to address is that batteries are mined in places where there are implications on human rights and overall labor standards. So by recovering and reusing these materials that have already been mined, we can reduce our environmental and societal impacts surrounding materials for batteries. Next slide, please. So there's been a recent push to electrify the transportation sec sector, and this has generated a lot of interest in battery recycling. You may have seen a lot of OEMs come out and say that they want to electrify their transportation fleets by 2035, 2040, or 2050. And for all these electric vehicles, we'll need a lot of batteries. And the batteries in electric vehicles are very big, so they contain a lot of materials. And today, there are over 1 million electric vehicles on the road. However, these batteries won't reach their end of life for another 10 to 15 years. And even if you think about 10 to 15 years ago, there probably weren't very many people you know driving electric vehicles. So we still have to wait a while for all of these big batteries from the vehicles to come back. So in the meantime, where are we going to get all of this material to do battery recycling? Um, one big source of material would be manufacturing scraps. So the waste that the battery industry is already producing, it's estimated that in the next three years, by 2025, that over 80% of the material for recycling will be supplied by this waste or manufacturing scrap from the battery industry. Um, so that's great. But there's another underutilized source of material that we can get these critical battery materials from, and that's electronic devices. So if you're anything like me and my household, you have cell phones stashed in your drawers or old dead laptops stuck in your closets, we really need to start getting those back from people. Um, so while there are a lot of old devices out there, the um, ways we're using to try to get those um, devices back and collect them can still use a lot of work um, because since they're all in your houses, you're obviously not giving them up. So we need to really um, improve our collection practices. Uh, and here's a fun fact for you. It takes over 166 iPhones to produce enough cobalt to make an EV battery. Um, these numbers are from J.B. Straubel, who's the former CTO of Tesla um, and the current founder of Redwood Materials, which is the, one of the U.S.'s largest battery recyclers. And just think about that. It might only take 30 households to get enough um, material to make part of an EV battery. So I think that's really exciting. Um, next slide, please. And I want to talk more about um, battery recycling and what we're doing here at Argonne. The Department of Energy's first advanced battery recycling R&D effort, the Resale Center, was established in 2019, and we're working to help grow a globally competitive U.S. recycling industry. We work in resale to develop cost-effective uh, flexible processing technology so that we can extract as much value as possible from both current and future battery chemistries. And as I mentioned in the last slide, the battery recycling industry is still in its early stages and most of that incoming material is coming from manufacturing scrap and some consumer electronics. 
So the problem with battery recycling today is that it is being done, but the economics are very challenging and batteries from electric vehicles or grid applications in most cases cost money to recycle. And that's because the recycling methods used, they use a lot of energy, they require extensive processing, and they generate large amounts of waste. Uh, the two most common technologies used today are pyrometallurgical and hydrometallurgical um, recycling processes. Uh, pyroprocessing basically involves taking a battery, putting it into a high temperature furnace so you can melt the metals and burn off anything else. Um, that means that you're generating materials that have to be re-refined and purified before they go back to the battery industry. Um, the second way is hydrometallurgical processing. So basically you're taking the materials inside of the battery, dissolving them in a strong acid, then you can make and purify salts to go back into the cathode manufacturing process. Um, but the problem is that we need profitable recycling. So to really drive a healthy electric, uh, electrification infrastructure, um, we need profit. So other recycling options are being considered. Um, this is where resale comes into play. Uh, we started looking at direct recycling, which is a third way to recycle batteries. And it involves maintaining the original chemical structure of the materials that are in the batteries by recovering them, regenerating them, and reusing them directly. And by retaining the original um, structure of the components, we retain the original value and can generate components that are lower cost uh, to supply to battery manufacturers. And like I said, there are these three different recycling technologies. Uh, Resell is working to develop new technologies and all of these recycling pathways as a way to drive down costs and increase profits. And this is important because nobody's going to want to pay to recycle batteries. Uh, Jeff Spangenberger, the director of Resell, likes to say, we need to get batteries to be like scrap metal. If you have any big scrap metal at your house, you take it out, you put it on a curb, somebody in a pickup truck comes by, within a couple hours it's probably gone. That's because they can take it to the junkyard or whatever and be able to get value out of that. So there's value in it. If you put an EV battery out by the curb, which you wouldn't do, but theoretically, nobody's going to want to take it. Um, so that's why battery recycling is really important. We need to make these batteries have values so that we can do the recycling. Uh, next slide, please. The Resale Center is led by Argonne, but it's a partnership with other national labs and universities. Uh, and we bring together battery recycling expertise um, from these national labs, university, and also industry so we can help bridge the gaps that are keeping us from realizing the most successful battery recycling infrastructure. And we do research in the Resale Center through these four focus areas. And then, um, as Paul mentioned earlier, uh, we previously had about 30 projects dedicated to this work, um, but this year we just doubled our funding and doubled our amount of um, projects that we're working on. So we actually have over 60 projects in um, the area of battery recycling right now. Uh, the two areas to the right, the direct recycling and advanced resource recovery I told you about on the last slide, these were um, covered in the three different areas of battery recycling. We're also working on design for sustainability. So we're working on making um, batteries more sustainable by improving the material choice, um, improving battery design, um, and also looking into second life opportunities. So when a battery comes out of an electric vehicle, there's still a lot of energy left. So instead of sending that battery to recycling, we should use the energy that's left in it. Um, so we should use it in a second application like grid storage um, to get the most uh, benefit possible from these batteries that we're making. The last area is modeling and analysis. We're developing tools to provide a deep materials understanding and also to evaluate economic and environmental impacts of the recycling processes that we're developing. Next slide, please. 
So in resale, we work closely with industry. And one of the ways we do that is using this model called Everbat. Everbat is a model that allows for the comparison of different recycling material scenarios. Um, and this is actually an Excel spreadsheet. So you can get it online, um, put in numbers, um, and get costs and various environmental impacts out. Um, using Everbat, we can identify these different costs and environmental hotspots throughout the life cycle of a battery. And this helps us to direct and valid validate our battery recycling research and overcome some of the potential barriers to commercialization. And with that, I'd like to close tonight's talks by underscoring Argonne's role in mitigating the impacts of climate change through battery recycling research. George showed us that we can develop batteries to build a more resilient electric grid and also significantly reduce carbon emissions generated by the transportation sector. Later, we saw that it's critical to take responsibility for the batteries that we're producing and also the materials that we're putting into them, if we're, especially if we're going to have to keep up with the future demand for energy storage. So thank you for your attention, and I'd like to give the podium back to Susan. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica, George, and Paul for your presentations. I think everyone can see uh, how clear it is that we need immediate action. You can also see what an incredible place this is to be able to work and what a resource it is to the United States. The topic of something as seemingly innocent as batteries really is an intersection of science, investment, geopolitics, and believe it or not, the glue that's holding all of this together are economics. So I don't know if you understood that, but this science institution does a thing called techno-economics where we understand how all these bits and pieces fit together, and I think Jessica did just an, a really outstanding job of explaining that. So thank all three of you. Thank you so much. So now. It's your turn. Let's hear from our audience. What are your questions? For our in-person guests, please pass your cards to the center aisle and our Outload team will retrieve them. For our virtual audience, remember to submit your questions using the chat feature. These will be read by Leslie, okay? And um, so Leslie, do you have a question from our virtual audience? I have several. All right, All right, we're gonna start with one that has come in a couple of times. I'm gonna send it to George, and it's really, can you just speak a little bit more, elaborate a little bit more on the future of electric or battery-powered aircraft and the timeline? You mentioned it, but people would like you to elaborate a little bit more on that topic. Great question, Leslie, and thanks for that, and thanks to whoever it was online that, that sent that question in. Yeah, aviation is maybe the most, uh, romantic and the most obvious uh, and the most challenging application for batteries. Uh, the batteries we have now just don't have the energy density that's needed. Remarkably, the airline industry is eager to get electric aviation. Why? Because they fly their planes all the time. They want them on the ground for the minimum time, unload the cargo or the passengers, reload, take off. Takes about two hours. That's the time required to charge almost any lithium ion battery with a fast charger. So uh, that's one reason. Second reason, the maintenance costs are way less for electric flight than it is for mechanical flight. There's almost no moving parts in a motor, one or two. That's about it. A gasoline engine or a diesel engine, jet engine would have many more. Uh, and the third reason is it's cheaper to fly on electricity than it is to fly on jet fuel. So they're eager for this uh, new development. It's a huge challenge in the sense that you need a completely different battery, two or three times, maybe four times, the energy density. If you had, let's say, let me get my numbers right here, if, if it's three times the energy density, that would enable regional flight. So flights up to about 600 miles. That's what it is from here to Washington, D.C., for example. Uh, if you want to go transatlantic, you're going to have to have a bigger battery than that. So one of the questions is, is it really a battery that you want for aviation, or is it maybe a substitute for jet fuel or 
symbolically for all fossil fuels that you could burn and would have the same energy density but not emit any CO2. And that's a question. Uh, there's another option and that's a fuel cell. It doesn't have to be a battery. It could be a hydrogen fuel cell where you produce the electricity on the plane from hydrogen. Uh, and that has the advantage of being more efficient than combustion. Uh, but I think these are open questions. And how will we find out the answer? We'll find out by trying. So we can do all the modeling we want, we can do all the laboratory experience, uh, experiments that we want, but you're gonna have to actually demonstrate it. And when that happens, we'll start to get the answers. All right, all right, that's excellent. If, if I may just add one, one extra aspect to that, George. There is, as we are building towards these um, very difficult goals, there is an intermediate step which is called green fuels. These are fuels which do emit CO2 when you burn them, but they come from biomass sources. So if you look over the whole entire life cycle, the amount of CO2 that's produced is about the same as if they were going to, uh, if, the, if the biomass was going to produce just CO2 sitting around anyway. So this is an intermediate step. You still have CO2, but over the entire integrated life cycle, you still have a gain. That's one of, the, one of the first steps that we have. All right, I think we are getting to the next step where we have, am I supposed to do these in order? I think I am. Okay, all right, George. George, you're very popular, George. Are utility companies cooperating in this effort to bring batteries to the mainstream? I'm sorry, are the what? Are utilities, ah, good are they cooperating in this effort to bring batteries to the mainstream? I, so I think they are. If you take the case of EVs, automotive, passenger cars, there's universal agreement, as I was saying earlier, and everybody's on board. This is the answer. With utilities, it's a little more difficult uh, because the lifetime of most utility devices generation is much longer, maybe 40 years or more, uh, compared to a car. So there is kind of a, uh, we have to wait for the present technology to wear out or we have to replace it before it wears out. Those things are sometimes called stranded assets. So there are very good economic reasons why it isn't quite as compelling uh, for the utilities as it is for EVs. Another issue is regulation. We all buy cars, whatever we like. You wanna buy a Tesla, do it. You wanna buy a Nissan, do that. Whereas utilities are highly regulated, they have to get approval. Uh, for very good reasons. And there are 50 states and 50 different approval um, sort of boards that have to say yes. So if you're doing something that's interstate, it can be quite a long permitting process, maybe 10 years, uh, to get a transmission line built, say to bring the wind energy from Iowa to Chicago. So it's a different kettle of fish. Uh, but I think the utilities certainly see the handwriting on the wall. They're all in Stratford. It was last year, when was it? 2019 or 2020? Uh, the the uh, renewable, new energy, new renewable energy generation represented um, the most new investment that year. It was bigger than natural gas, bigger than coal, bigger than everything else. And that has been the case ever since. So the trend is there. It's going to happen. Uh, it might be a little bit more challenging and a different set of problems. All right, that's very good. If I may also add to that, <laughs> as a person who does this, the utility companies are in an, in an interesting position. Of, so if you consider the two main categories of transportation and then grid storage, for transportation, we've been working on batteries for cars for 30 years, and the OEMs, GM and Ford and all of them, they were working hand in hand with the government and with the national labs to develop these technologies. So when they became available, they were very familiar with the technologies that they were going to need to invest in. It's not the same with utilities. They are, what the tools that they have and the businesses they run and the way they produce power, it's so very different than it is in transportation. So there's a greater disconnect and they have a, it's difficult for them to understand what are the right batteries to use. So this is a role that the national labs play that's very important in helping the utilities to understand the economics and to make these decisions. So uh, it is, it's harder for them. Uh, do we have another question um, from our chat, Leslie? 
Yes, we do. This one's going to go to Jessica. A um, couple of uh, questions around materials that can be recycled. So specifically, can we recycle alkalins and are old hybrid vehicles a source of batteries for recycling? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so for alka alkaline batteries, um, that's not something we look at so much. We're mostly looking at lithium ion batteries. Um, but I would say the materials inside of those are cheaper. Um, so it would be harder to be able to make a profit from recycling those types of batteries. Um, but it is something that people are looking into. And then for lithium ion batteries, uh, hybrid batteries are a source of interest. Uh, so they still contain uh, cathode materials that contain the critical materials I mentioned, the lithium, cobalt, nickel, or manganese. Um, so any type of electric vehicle or hybrid electric vehicle has batteries that we would be interested in um, for battery recycling. All right. All right, our next question is for Paul. Okay, Let's see if we can stump the boss. All right. <laughs> Paul, what is the best way for the venture community to interface with Argon in order to help the emerging companies? Uh -huh. Well, good question for sure. There are many ways. I think, first of all, uh, you know, really, uh, we have what we call the s and which is strategic, I'm sorry, science and technology uh, partnerships and outreach. It's a, a part of the organization here at the laboratory really built to help uh, industry engage with the lab and really help understand the technologies that we're developing and help them uh, really uh, evaluate the commercial viability of those uh, technologies as well as uh, help industry in terms of advancing their own technologies and so it's an interface point if you will and so that's one great example of the kind of uh, effort we've taken undertaken to really make it easier for industry to engage uh, with the laboratory and understand our capabilities in that way so that that would be one thing you know another thing I would mention is uh, what we call Volta energy technologies uh, George mentioned uh, form energy has been out from uh, the JC's or the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research the Volta Energy Technology spun out from the laboratory in 2017, and they're actually in the business of de-risking, de uh, if you will, uh, in investments by uh, venture capitals and capitalists and others in term, in, uh, into battery technology. And so uh, they like to really pride themselves. There are half a dozen folks or so from the laboratory that actually, uh, as I said, spun out, established their own company. They're funded by uh, strategic uh, investments from industry as well as from uh, uh, private capital as well to really help uh, folks evaluate uh, different battery technologies to see if it's worthy of investment uh, based upon its commercial potential. And so uh, that's another great example of how uh, folk can really uh, lean into the laboratory and, and kind of uh, uh, take a look at what we offer and what others offer and, and uh, decide whether or not it's worthy of investment. So a couple of examples there as well. Awesome. Very good. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, another question from our audience. It's our virtual audience. Uh, sure. Um, uh, this one's a George question. <laughs> I'm stand up so George can see me. So there is a typo or a misunderstanding in this question, which I'm going to let you clarify. But uh, the question was, about eight or nine years ago, Argonne received $5 billion. That's the typo. Um, for a 555 project um, where we were going to increase the density, reduce the cost, et cetera. And the question is, whatever happened to that project? So, George, why don't you clarify Jay Caesar, the 555 challenge and the funding we got? Great question, Leslie. And I, I, I wish the typo were real. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so back in 2012, we, when we first launched Jay Caesar, it's now nine plus years old. Uh, we were looking at the market and we look at personal electronics. That was the main uh, market for lithium ion batteries. It was one size fits all. So whatever your personal electronics is, a cell phone, a, you know, a laptop, a Kindle, name anything else, it was powered by a lithium ion battery. And we took that to the next step. We said, well, we're going to need more than the lithium ion battery, but let's make the next generation battery one size fits all. We'll, we'll use it for EVs, we'll use it for transportation, and anything else you can think of. That was our goal. And our estimate was, okay, if that's our goal, we'll need five times the energy density, and we'll need one-fifth the cost. 
So what's happened in 10 years? First of all, lithium-ion batteries themselves have come down in cost by more than a factor of five. So immediately, one of our conditions was already filled by the incumbent. The other one was a lot tougher, five times the energy density. And we experimented in the, in the lab with uh, a couple of batteries that might be able to do that. So multivalent batteries where uh, calcium, magnesium, and zinc each have two electrons they can give up. Lithium has one. So for each atom, you're getting twice the energy. That was a big step forward. Uh, and we thought, well, it doesn't have to be lithium ion. It can be lithium sulfur, which is a popular battery still being uh, explored in the lab and in some startup companies. So that uh, battery reached three times the energy density. So I would say we came close to meeting our goals. We were, what can I say, visionary. We, they were stretch goals. Uh, and. Our, our vision now is, is a, a little bit different. Be happy to go into that if there's time. I would say we've got a lot of questions. Let's move to the next one that Sue we has. Do have, we do have a lot of questions. Here's one that seems innocent and straightforward for you, Jessica. Are you ready? OK. How is AI being used in the new material development space and or recycling AI? Yeah, thank you for that question. So artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, that's something a lot of people are using for battery disassembly. So when you're getting all these batteries back, you would have a big conveyor belt or line that you would be transporting these batteries into the recycling process. If you're getting electronic devices, they might have to be disassembled to take out the battery. If you're getting big electric vehicle packs, um, a pack contains modules which contain a bunch of cells. So depending on whatever level you're getting down to for this recycling, you're going to have to take a large, apart that large battery pack. So there's a lot of research right now going into um, AI and machines for disassembling these um, and taking them apart to get the materials out for recycling. Um, it's really a challenge because the batteries not only contain the housing um, for the battery itself, but the housing and all the electronics and wires in the pack. So if you were just to throw that in a shredder, there can be a lot of contamination um, that you would have to remove later. So if you can take these apart, you can reduce the contamination and make the refining and purification easier uh, later down the road. So there's a lot of AI and machine learning going into robotics to do that kind of stuff. All right. We could go on and on about AI, but we will stop and do the next question. All right, Sue, I'm sending this one to you. Oh. It is a question about yeah. the role of nuclear uh, in all the grid uh, discussions and uh, storage in the grid, and what's the role of nuclear in that? What is, okay, so the question is, what is the role of nuclear in the grid? And I'll answer that in sort of two ways. What do we, what do we, how do we see it today, and how did we see it in the past? In the past, the nuclear was not really the favorite child. There were a lot of reasons for it, and they were very much misinformed. Nuclear has been, historically, what we call our base load. You turn it on, and it runs at one power level all along. Now, what's happened is nuclear is undergoing, essentially, a renaissance as we begin to look at renewables. I'm on several panels in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations where I, where I listen to the experts debate the role of nuclear, and I can tell you that nuclear is going to be coming back, and it is going to be very important. But it's not the nuclear that we had in the past. The nuclear that we have in the future are going to be, many times, are going to be smaller nuclear reactors. They call these SMR, small nuclear reactors. These tend to fit in a more distributed grid that we are building out today. That's one. The other one's when nuclear is going to be a base load. The device, the plants will be standardized. I don't know how many people are aware of this, but many of our nuclear plants, they were not built all the same. Each one was individualized, which is why they became so expensive, and they took forever, and that was quite a burden on those who were investing in them. So nuclear 
was important. It went through a period of time where it was not so favored. And now as we take a really hard look at it, we use economics and we use our head and there's a lot of rational thought. It is a very clear and important part of our future. So small nuclear reactors and distributed energy, larger nuclear reactors, when they're very large, they're going to be standardized. So it is very important. And it is, it's a really in a renaissance. Okay. All right, now our next question is for Paul. This is taking a step back. Paul, earlier in this month, you attended the United Nations Climate Change Conference during which global decarbonization was discussed. I'm sure there are many things that you could tell us about it, and we'd love to hear all of them. But what would you like to give us as some of your key takeaways from this exciting event? Yeah, it's uh, really a privilege to be able to attend and represent not only Argonne, but the national laboratories at what we call COP27 uh, in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, Egypt, gathering of some 30,000 people, uh, really fantastic, 120 countries, I should say, uh, 30,000 people from those countries. So really a fantastic opportunity to, to think about, uh, really at a large scale, how we address climate change and uh, collectively what we, can, what we do together to really make a difference. Uh, in the near term, on a relatively fast uh, timeline, and so fascinating conversation. You know, I think a, a few takeaways uh, I would offer, it, and one is uh, you have to really be inspired uh, by the effort that is underway uh, across the world, really, in terms of development of new technology or improving existing technology, much like we've talked to, about this evening. It's really not just happening here at Argonne, it's not just happening here in the U.S., but it's happening across the world. There's a strong sense and a strong desire uh, really to work together uh, across uh, internationally to really make uh, these data technologies happen. So one of the Department of Energy's uh, areas of emphasis is what we call energy earth shots, which they've identified uh, six or eight, if you will, key technologies where uh, significant improvement is needed to really enable uh, decarbonization of our economy here in the U.S. And so. Uh, energy, long duration energy storage, which we've talked about this evening, is one example, but also uh, hydrogen production is another great example. Geothermal uh, technology is one that's also been identified in, in uh, really decarbonization of industrial use of heat is another great example, but th that's one uh, takeaway I would offer. Another is, uh, I got to attend as well the previous uh, year a COP in Scotland, and uh, I was really uh, struck for the first time uh, uh, by the number of young people really involved in this effort across the world, which again I found quite inspiring. They're really knowledgeable, they really do their homework, they come with great ideas, they come uh, willing to ask questions that are difficult, they come really uh, wanting to make a point or two or uh, not let uh, my generation uh, slide by on the topic of climate change. Uh, and so it's really encouraging in that way. Uh, I think uh, this year's COP from, uh, differed from the previous year. And one other item I would mention, and that really was uh, women now have a stronger voice. Uh, just in a year, uh, it was remarkable, the number of uh, women that were on point, you know, speaking up for their countries or speaking up on behalf of industry. And so uh, really inspiring to me as the director of a national laboratory, really, that uh, has the privilege the honor of working with so many talented people to, to really get together on, on a global scale with others doing the same thing, interested in the same push. So just a few observations, really exciting. Well, that's, I mean, it would have been great for every one of us, I'm sure, to be there, to be a fly on the wall. So thank you so much for that. Um, we are getting down in our time, so we have the ability to take just one more question. Um, can I choose it, or would you like to go for the... Yeah. Let's take two. I'll choose one and you choose one. All so right. I have chosen one. We'll have to go fast. All right. Please do. Fast. We'll go fast. <laughs> so uh, the question, there's a lot of people in the chat who really want to help. And so they're asking, you know, what can they do um, from driving less, flying less, and other conservational type techniques to are there programs with hospitals or libraries where they can drop off, you know, materials that could then be recycled? So uh, I would throw that out to all of you for a kind of lightning round answer on what, what people in the community can do and how we're working with the community to help advance these objectives. All right. How about if we start at that end? One answer from each one of you. Jessica, what would you offer to do? Sure. Um, so the... 
collecting uh, devices for recycling, uh, you can go online and go to a website called Call to Recycle. Um, they have a big collection effort for collecting batteries. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, collection boxes at your local Home Depots um, and other places. So that's a great resource for going to see where you can drop off old electronic devices. Okay, George, one suggestion on climate change. Yeah, and <laughs> this, I'm gonna build off something that Paul said. Uh, so if you look to the future, we need a lot of climate workers, including people who are gonna install uh, solar cells, wind turbines, and storage but also people who are going to invent the next generation of commercial technology. So I would encourage all the younger people in the online crowd to think about a career in climate change. It's a really safe career, because climate change is gonna be around for the whole length of your career. <laughs> so you'll have, you'll have employment for the rest of your life. <laughs> Paul. I'm gonna uh, encourage really uh, to continue to learn, continue to gather information and continue to learn and, and uh, coming to Argon Out Loud, if I could be a little, little self-serving in my response, just continue to participate as we have forums like these. But look for other forums in, in your community as well where you can engage in the conversation and, and become part of the voice uh, really driving the change. All right, and with three seconds left, I'll have one, mine will be brief, it'll be prophetic. I would say turn out your lights when you leave a room because yeah. that actually adds up. <laughs> All right, and so with no further ado, our time has run out, but I do want to thank our presenters for this informative and engaging conversation. I also want to thank our audience, those of you who are virtual, and those of you who went out in the cold and the wind today. It's, it's very admirable. We thank you so much uh, for your thought-provoking questions. We hope you've enjoyed the conversation, and now I will turn things back to Leslie. And I just want to add my thanks uh, to all of our presenters, to our in-person audience, our online audience. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, we will do this again, probably in February, on a topic to be determined. So we invite you back, uh, and we'll send out a notice so that you know when that will be. Uh, and otherwise, we wish you a safe journey home. And. Uh, uh, Happy holidays as well for the next couple of weeks. So again, thanks very much. The recording will be out in a couple of days if you want to rewatch it or share it with your friends and family. Have a good night. <laughs>